Los Angeles police calling all cars, attention all cars. A hold up of a United States mail truck at 3rd Street and Traction Avenue. Suspects escape in a large black touring car, license unknown. That's all. Rolls and quits. Many people ask us where we get the name cracked for Rio Grande's great gasoline. Here's the answer. This name is derived from the up-to-the-minute refining method known as cracking. In cracking, the crude oil is subjected to terrific heat and pressure. The result is a gasoline which averages 10 points higher in anti-knock than those which are not cracked. To this gasoline is added tetraethyl. As a result, you can buy Rio Grande cracked with tetraethyl, the gasoline which powers more police cars, fire engines, and other emergency equipment in the great Southwest than all other brands combined. It is now our privilege to introduce the man through whose civic-minded cooperation Calling All Cars is made possible. Chief James E. Davis of the Los Angeles Police Department. Chief Davis. Scotland Yard has been internationally publicized as a law enforcement agency which has never lost a case brought to it for investigation. This great branch of English government reaches across the face of the earth to bring to certain justice thousands who perpetrate crimes against the Crown. In Canada, the Northwest Mounted Police has established a world-renowned reputation, the ideal of every imaginative youth, that of always getting their man. Few people know that the Los Angeles Police Department and the departments of the United States are equally as efficient and equally as successful in the pursuit of criminals. Due to public lethargy, lack of public interest, and limited means of publicity and propaganda, the police departments of this nation have been unable to establish themselves as a united peacetime army whose tenaciousness in the battle against criminals actually keeps this nation and the lives and property of citizens safe from dangerous attacks and complete control of underworld characters. It has been my desire ever since the day I entered the police department 21 years ago to help make the Los Angeles Police Force a powerful and efficient crime deterrent. During my first term as chief, I began departmental reorganization, which I am now attempting to complete. The public little knows the constant vigilance necessary on the part of a chief of police to keep a great organization such as ours functioning smoothly and efficiently with its limited manpower over an area of some 450 square miles during these times of social unrest. We believe we have to date brought about remarkable results in crime prevention, and this is due to the cooperation of the public and to the loyalty and personal pride shown by the personnel. It is my honor to lead. Shortly before coming here tonight, I received a monthly report of the crime activities, several features of which should be of interest. To all citizens listening whose investment this department is, these figures show that burglaries decreased 33% in May 1934 over May 1933 last year. Burglaries decreased 16% in May 1934 over April 1934 last month. Robberies decreased 44% in May 1934 over May 1933 last year. Robberies decreased 23% in May 1934 
over April 1934, last month. The story I have brought to you this evening will give you a colorful picture of how the Los Angeles Police Department, through its able officers, tracks down and brings to justice certain criminal types. I feel particularly proud of my men for the part they played in solving the crime to be portrayed for you here tonight. This story should make you keenly conscious of the little publicized fact that your police department has but few failures in criminal investigations chalked up against it. The scene is the Los Angeles County Jail. The time is the summer of 1925. The cast is comprised of Herb Wilson, ex parson turned notorious mail robber, awaiting transfer to San Quentin to begin a life term, and Chuck Wagner and Sam Sandberg, being held under charges of robbery for the theft of $19,000 from an oil company messenger. The curtain rises on two adjacent cells, one occupied by Wilson, the other by Sandberg and Wagner, who are at this moment being readmitted to their cell by a guard. The play begins. Well, Chuck, that's well. Yeah, I won't be long now till we're out of this. Hey, pipe down. down. Listen. Tap back to him. Can you hear me? Not very well. Come on up to the front of the cell. Okay. Yeah, how's this? Better. How'd you make out? Our mouthpiece is going to spring us okay. That's swell. How much, Peter? $10,000 bond. A piece? Yeah. Hey, that's pretty high. <laughs> you think you guys are worth it? Why, sure we do. How about it, Chuck? The damn tooth we are. Once we get out of this bogey, we'll knock over that much in no time. How? Uh, oh, holding up messengers? Maybe. Then why don't you birds wise up? What do you mean? Well, if you don't, you'll be spending the rest of your lives in stir. Uh, you're a fine one to talk. Look where you are. Yeah. Well, I never went to the can yet for no lousy few grand. I done pretty well while I was knocking them over. Now they've got me for good. Well, that's okay, too. But it ain't no reason why I shouldn't just stare a couple of pals of mine straight. Of course, if you don't want the benefit of my advice, that's different. No, no, it ain't that, Herb. Sure. We'd like to hear your angle. Well, how about you, Sam? Sure, I would. I want to tell what's on your mind. Okay. Now, get this. Sam, you've got the big stride of them with this ball for that car, then, don't you? Yeah. And you've got to be there, don't you? Well, if I ain't, the rest will come after me. Right? Now, if you ride the routes back to Leavenworth, you won't have a prayer of beating that rat. You've got to have dough for a mouthpiece. That's right. That's what we were trying to get when they picked us up on this job. Okay, that's because you were dumb. Now, here's what you ought to do. As soon as your mouthpiece springs you, you ought to knock over the United States mail. The United States mail? Quiet, quiet. Here comes the guard. Get back into your cell to be passed. Just do something. Go on, sing. Uh, oh. Oh, I wish I had had an angel over the planet. Pipe down. Uh, huh? right, pipe down. What was that whispering I heard down this way? What whispering? Nobody was whispering. I was just trying to get the words of that song. Well, stop trying. And if you do get them, I'll turn the hose on you and cool you off. You must ain't here to study community there. Well, when the mail leaves the downtown post office for the railroad station, it's divided. Straight mail 
in Sandberg and Wagner, Herb Wilson finds eager pupils. During the long days they pass in prison, waiting the arrangement for their bail, the two Tyro mail robbers learn in every detail the technique of the highly specialized job of looting the post. Then, as soon as they're released on $10,000 bonds, they propose the mail job to their confederates, Dago Frank Teskeona, Jack Davidson, and Harry Burke. Plans are carefully laid. And at 9.20 on the night of October the 7th, 1925, Wagner, Teskeona, and Sandberg are loitering in the shadows along 3rd Street. Herb tells me the truck leaves the arcade station at 9.15. They ought to be along here any minute now. Guess they load onto the eastbound limited that pulls out of the Santa Fe at 9.45. Yeah, I think they do. Say, where's the jack and the kid? I thought they were going to be along, huh? No, I sent them out to steal another car. We're going to have to make a quick getaway when we pull this job. Good chance. Here comes up now. That's the regular me. How do you know that? Just the driver aboard. Here's number two. Let's see what she can. Here's the man you too. Here comes another one. That's it. See those three guys up front? Sure. That's the guard and the postal clerk with the driver. And say, look, it's the last truck. If they run them in that auto tomorrow night, it's a cinch. At the same time the following night, a high-powered touring car is parked, motored idling at the corner of Traction Avenue and 3rd Street. Sparsely spaced park lights throw a feebly flickering glow on the deserted street. A busy mart of trade by day. At night, this quarter of the city furnishes a splendid setting for the crime. Oh, the picture is perfect. Six desperate criminals, armed with sawed-off shotguns, lurking in the shadow of a warehouse, waiting to rob the mail. It's the mail. It sounds like the dream of a dime novel author, but it's a fact. This is what happened. Want to be along any minute now? Everybody know what he's to do? Sure. Chuck and the me, we hold the guns on him. Right, Jack, drive. And don't let that motor die on him. Oh, don't worry, I won't. And the kid and I cover him from the car. Yeah, and I throw the spot on him. All right, now hold everything. Here they come. That's the regular meal. Here comes the next one. Come on, on your toes, boy. Number two. That's regular mail, too. That's your baby. And here she comes. All right, boy. Go, Jack. Okay. Okay, Jack. Crowd them over. All right. Get over you. Get over you. Hey, what is this? Get out of here. I'll make them a damn quick stew. Lay off that gun, Mr. I'll spray you. Take them. Get away from him, Frank. Hold on, Adam. Get now file into this car and keep your trap shut. Hey, what are you getting me in for, Sam? I thought you wanted me to help on a hijacking job. Well, what's the difference? Yeah, but this is the mail. Well, it's still hijacking. You're in on it, so shut up. Come on, you guys. Get in there. Okay, Chuck. You drive the car. Right. Come on, Frank. Follow us, boys. by the bandit, the mail truck is driven 12 blocks, closely followed by the robber's car. At the end of the trip, it is steered into a vacant lot and parked against a brick wall. Safe from the prying eyes of passing traffic, the bandits line up, the post office employees facing the wall. As one of the mob holds a shotgun on the terrified men, another frisks them for the keys to the truck. Then, under the glare of a spotlight, 20 sacks of registered mail are quickly transferred to two other automobiles that have been parked in the lot. This task rapidly performed, the outlaws get into an argument. Yeah, but I'm going to try to tell you something. We should have bumped them all off. I don't see what we got to do that for, Frank. Oh, what's the matter then? Not too much, huh? They were sinners enough to recognize again. Yeah, but it don't seem right to kill them in cold blood. But I'm going to tell you, it's the only way. If you don't do this thing, you're going to be sorry. Hey, what do you boys think about it? You're right, Chuck. Sure, I'm right. Well, I don't see any sense in having murder to the rabbit. What's the difference? When you monkey with the federal government, you might as well go the whole way. Hey, wait a minute. How's this? Let's give them a sporting chance. We'll cut the coin for it. Well, all right. But I'm telling you, you're going to be sorry. That's all. Sure, sure. that's fair enough. Hey, you over there. Who, me? Yeah, you do. What do you, what do you want? I'm going to touch the coin. Call your choice. What's the big idea? If you lose, we bump you. Pardon me. Here goes. What do you want? 
Ted. Ed, it is. Oh, but I'm telling you, we should have pumped them off. Oh, oh, shut up. up. We said we'd give them a chance, didn't we? And they won. Well, come on, you birds. Get in this truck. We're going to make some registered mail out here. What are you going to do now? <laughs> Don't worry. We're just locking you up in the cage here so you can't tip them off too soon. Come on, get in there and make it All snappy. Right. Step on it. Step on it. Come on and get in there. The trouble with you, you've got a too much of good luck. Now, come on. Now, snap onto the padlock. <laughs> a fine-looking bunch of Christmas packages you are. Robbery detail, Captain Cato speaking. What? Yes, right away. Hey, boys, it's a holdup, United States Mail. Certain question. Wallace, you and Hamlin come along with me. Make it snappy. Captain Cato and his men arrive at the scene of the robbery a few short minutes after the bandits have made their getaway. They release the frightened post office employees. And from their excited and garbled accounts, they reconstruct the crime. However, everything has happened so quickly, and there's been so little light, that none of the men can help the police with a very adequate identification of the robbers. No fingerprints are found on the mail truck. And although Captain Cato prosecutes the investigation to the utmost, little headway is made until late the next day, when the suspicious citizen unwittingly comes to the assistance of the police. Yes, sir. What can I do for you? Gleason, I've been all over this place, and finally they send me to you. Yes, well, what is it? Well, I shouldn't want to cause any trouble, but I got my suspicions. Suspicions about what? About this $20 bill here. Well, what about it? No, a fellow owed me $20, see? And he paid me back today, and he says, this ain't counterfeit, but don't take it to the bank. And so I got my suspicions. I ain't going to be done out of no money, and I want you to tell me if this money's good or there ain't it. Well, where'd you get it? I'm telling you where I got it. Yes, but what was the name of the man who gave it to you? Why, uh, Robert Cargo's his name. Where does he live? Start, I don't know. Know where he works? Sure, in a garage by Vitio Boulevard. But would you tell me if this money is any good? Well, I can't tell you tonight. Our, our money expert isn't here. But I'll tell you what I'll do. What will you do? I'll give you two $10 bills for that 20 What? Mr. Yamashuga, what do you want it for? Well, I can't tell whether it's counterfeit or not. And you want to be sure. So I'll give you good money for it. Why should you be taking a chance like that? Listen, do you want good money or not? I'm doing you a favor. <laughs> well, I should be turning down good money. <laughs> All right, so I'll take it. Good. Here you are. Thank you, mister. You're welcome. Good night. No, good night. Send Wallace in here. You want to see me, Captain? Yes. You got the serial numbers of that dough lost in the mail robbery? Yes, right here. Let me see it. Mm-hmm. Here it is. What's that? One of the bills stolen from the mail truck last night. We're looking up a mechanic by the name of Cargo in the morning. Early the next morning, Detectives Hamlin and Wallace parked their car a few blocks from the garage in which Cargo is employed. And Wallace walks to the garage, tells Cargo that his engine has gone dead, and asks him to come to look at it. The young man, suspecting nothing, returns to the waiting car with the detective. Here we are, this black sedan. Now, what seems to be the matter? And that's what we want to find out. You're under arrest. Hey, what is this? Snap the bracelets on him, Hammond. Right. Now get in that car. Hey, wait a minute. Shut up and get in. I'll drive. Now, Cargo, what do you know about that mail robbery the other night? What mail robbery? I don't know nothing. Oh, yes, you do. Well, I'll tell you, I don't. You know plenty about it, Cargo, and you're going to tell us everything you know. Yes, you know. get on cargo? Nothing, Captain. He denies everything, but he's guilty as the devil. Well, I've been checking up on his acquaintances. His girlfriend got $600 from him this morning. Yeah? Yeah. We just bought her in. She says that he told her that he had gotten it from a sale of some property back east. She looks innocent enough. Well, in that case, I can see a way to make him talk. He's just next door. Let's bring him in. Okay. Come on in here, cargo. Sit down. Where'd you get that $600 you gave your girl this morning? Uh, what? You heard me. Where'd you get that dough? Oh, I never gave no one $600. Oh, yes, you did. You gave it to your girl. Well, I haven't got a girl. Yes, you have. Her name's Betty Park. How did you find out? She's under arrest right now. Under arrest? Yes, under arrest. 
Now, where'd you get that money you gave her? Well, I, I got it from the sale of some, some property in Chicago. That's a lie. No, it isn't it's a truth. lie, Cargo. You got that money from mail robbery. No, I did not. Yes, you did. And you gave the money to your girl, and she's going to the penitentiary for receiving stolen goods. What? To the penitentiary for receiving stolen goods. No, no, no. Wait a minute. You can't do that. She hasn't done anything. She thought I got that dough from the East. But you didn't. No, I... That, well, that is... A... All right, Cargo. Come clean. Listen. Listen, if I do, will you lay, lay off, Betty? Well, I think that could be arranged if you will tell us what you know. Okay. In the first place, I didn't know we were going to knock over the mail. Chuck had propositioned me to go into a hijacking deal with him. Who's Chuck? Chuck Wagner. Go ahead. Well, I didn't know any of the other guys. I never met them until the night we pulled the job. What were their names? I don't remember. Honest, I don't. All right. What happened? Well, we, we started off at the corner of 3rd and Traction, and we got there about... Cargo's confession leads the officers to Chuck Wagner's apartment. They enter the place with a pass key while he is out and lock the door behind him. Well, doesn't look like he's kept. No, his clothes are all here. Uh-oh, look here. A pearl-handled revolver. Say, it's a beauty. Look at that design. Yeah. I want to take a look around and see if he's cast any of that door around here anyway. Hey, come on. Quit playing with that gun. Let's search the joint. You know, the construction of this gun interests me. I never told you about my granddad's collection of guns, did I? No, save it for a quiet winter's evening. Look, I got an idea. What? We'll wait till he comes in, hide in this closet here, and then we'll let him walk over to the dresser. Yeah, so he can get that gat and bumpers off, huh? No, 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 I want to play a joke on Oh, uh, look, we're not here to play jokes. Pipe I down, pipe down. Now, here's someone in the hall now. Quick, get in this closet. Hey, You're under arrest, Wagner. What? Why, you dirty... <laughs> What's the matter with this gun? It's no use, Wagner. I took out the firing pin. My granddad had a gun just like that. Okay. I guess you got me. Take your arms out, Wagner. There. That's just to make sure you don't run away on it. What? Make sure you don't run away on it. What? Make sure you don't run away on it. Well, maybe you wouldn't mind telling me what the charge is. Robbing the mail. What? Yes. Robbing the mail. What? Say, you guys are making a mistake. I run a tire repairing business. I don't know nothing about a May robbery. I don't know nothing about a May robbery. What May robbery? Well, we must tell you. It was the one the other night on 3rd Street. I suppose you don't know anything about that. Well, only what I read in the newspaper. Yeah. Well, you're coming along with us for a while. Maybe the accommodations down at headquarters will help to refresh your memory. <laughs> Wagner stoutly continues to deny any knowledge of the robbery, but the investigation goes on. From correspondence found in Wagner's shop, the trail leads to the house of Frank Teschiona on 106th Street. Wallace and Hamron present themselves to the home of the Italian. Your name Teschiona? Sure. What do you know about a mail robbery on 3rd Street? A mail robbery. You come here asking me about a mail robbery when I forgot of my own trouble. What's the matter with you? You look like you lost your best friend. Sure, I've lost my best friend, my wife. She's a runaway on me. Well, that's too bad. Now, what about this mail well, robbery? She's a take of 2000 bucks. All of my life's a saving. She's a much sweet bambino, sweet little lady. Then if she's a leave me, dirty tramp. Get that, Hamlin. She swiped two grand on him. Yeah. Where'd you get the two grand, Frank? Well, the money she's a, she's a coming from, from my savings, from a liquor I sell to my uh, orange county. Yeah, and what was his name? Oh, please, go away. Can't you see? I'm all sick of Who'd the Who'd you sell the liquor to? What? You Who'd say? you sell the liquor to? Oh, I can't remember the name. I'm going to tell you, I'm all broke up. Please go away. Please. Sure, we'll go away, Frank, and we'll take you with us. <laughs> After days of questioning, Teschiona finally admits his participation in the robbery when faced with thousands of dollars worth of loot, unearthed by officers in his house. Wagner, told of his pal's confession, denounces him as a double-crosser. But in the end, he leads the officers to a cache near Long Beach where $400,000 worth of bonds and bankers' checks are recovered. Lengthy investigation reveals Jack Davidson is a close friend of Wagner's. And he finally admits his guilt, and another $2,000 worth of loot, this time cash, is brought to light. Sandberg is picked up in Kansas City en route to face trial in Leavenworth. $900 more is found on his purse. Just the owner's wife is later apprehended in Chicago and returned to Los Angeles under a charge of receiving stolen goods. But the technicality of California law preventing husband from testifying against the wife and vice versa makes it impossible for the prosecution to build a case against her. In 
October 1925, Cargo, Davidson, Wagner, and Sandberg go on trial. They plead guilty and are quickly sentenced to 25 years in the federal penitentiary on McNeil's Island. Frank Castiona pleads not guilty and several months later goes on trial. Witnesses from all over the United States appear at the trial to identify the jewelry found on his premises. It is a sunny spring afternoon, and the judge delivers his verdict. Frank Castillo, you will stand and face the court. Before I pass judgment on you, have you anything to say? Sure, boss. I'm going to tell you, I'm not a guilty. It's a big, lousy firm up. I'm not to do anything. Frank Castillo, the jury has heard all the facts before it. They have given their verdict. And it is now my duty to pass judgment upon you. Frank Tuscano, I sentence you to serve 32 years in the federal prison. 32 years? Oh, my son of me. Oh, Judge, that's too much. It's too much. That... Where's that the lousy cop for the rest of me? Where is he? Want to see me, Frank? Sure. Sure. I want to tell you one thing. When I'm going to get out, I'm going to kill you. <laughs> well, Frank, my boy, that doesn't worry me much. They'll pat a good many of us on the face with a spade before you get out. Within three months of the time this daring mail robbery was staged, five of the six bandits were serving time in the penitentiary. One man remained at large. He, Harry Burke, was sought all over the United States. In May 1926, Captain Cato received word that he was once more in Los Angeles. Lieutenants Hawtrey, Barr, and Lloyd staked for Burke, and after a wild chase and gunfight, the sixth criminal was wounded and taken into custody. Burke, it was learned, was wanted for a bank robbery in Michigan, and $35,000 worth of his loot was recovered in Los Angeles following his arrest. He pleaded guilty to the mail robbery charge and quickly followed his pals to McNeil Island to serve a term of 25 years. Too much praise cannot go to Captain Cato for the manner in which he brought this case to a speedy conclusion and through the case he developed, secured a 100% conviction. Thank you, Chief Davis. Modern police radio car and the modern fire engine are built to deliver dependable service under all conditions and at an instant's notice. It is necessary that such equipment must be powered with dependable gasoline. Rio Grande cracked with tetraethyl is such a gasoline. In Los Angeles alone, the average mileage of a police car is 216 miles per day or 78,840 miles per year. With this undeniable proof of dependability to guide you, don't you think that a tank full of Rio Grande crack is worth at least a try? Remember, it costs no more. Now, here's a pointer on lubrication. Why not use as good oil as you use gasoline? Sinclair, Pennsylvania, and Sinclair Opaline Motor Oils are made by the largest independent refiner of lubricating oils in the world. They are sold only in extra measure tamper-proof cans thus guaranteeing you against substitution. They are extra refined, giving longer life. Yet Sinclair, Pennsylvania, and Sinclair Opaline cost no more than ordinary, often inferior oil. Cancellation broadcast 28. Suspect in U.S. mail robbery now in custody. That's all. Rules and quotes. Based on the confidential files of the Los Angeles Police Department, Calling All Cars is written and produced by William N. Roper. The author.